Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, today's video is going to be me going to go through experimental designs, um, commonly confused with sampling methods for some random stupid reason. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, if I say, uh, what's the experimental design of this experiment? And someone goes, volunteer sampling? Get out. Get out out right so you do need to know the difference uh, sampling methods is how you recruit participants experimental designs is how you're structuring an experiment um you know with with grouping for example completely different so before we start before we start we're looking at these three actually before we start i guess one useful thing to know is what a control group and an experimental group are right a control group is a condition in which you're kind of getting a baseline reading. So there's no manipulation happening in that um, in, in that condition. Whereas the in the experimental group, you are manipulating something to see the IV effect of DV. So let's just have a look just down here, for example, as, as a good example. The experiment in this case is, will student test scores be affected by distracting sounds in the testing environment? They could do one or two things. You could have one condition playing rock and one condition like uh, playing like a band music, for example, like that band music just there. And uh, you, you could see the difference. But those are two experimental conditions because you've got rock and band music. You're manipulating both. What you don't have is a baseline reading. Like what would happen if there was no rock if there was no if there was just silence for example and that there is the control group so a control group is basically you kind of do need to know this not necessarily for experimental designs but it is useful but a control group is essentially a uh, a non-experimental group whereby the the IV is basically absent right you are not manipulating anything it's a baseline reading I hope that makes sense now, what we are looking at today is experimental designs. Essentially, how you um, structure an experiment, right? Um, quite simple, um, if you get it. I think well, everything is simple if you get it, I guess. But the three types of research designs we are looking after, are looking at, sorry, are independent groups, matched pairs, by far the more complicated one, and then repeated measures as well. So let's start in this case by looking oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at, well, I don't know if I, I need to redo these slides, admittedly, and hopefully by the time you actually look at these slides, they're going to be a lot better because they're just a bit bitty for my liking. But we've got we've got a basic research methods experiment just here. Uh, the playing of rock music will have a significant effect on the number of items recalled in an object recognition task compared to the playing of easy listening music. Now, if you've watched the hypotheses uh, video, you will know that you need one I you need one IV and two IV in a hypothesis, and you need a um, a DV that is measurable and numerical. Right, so we, we have that as a very, very good uh, hypothesis. Thank you. So the first the first one we're going to look at is independent groups. So at the beginning, what you do, you recruit your participants, and that is sampling methods, right? That's that's how you recruit your participants. But you've got your sample, and here they are, all strangely wearing blue. Um, now, here's what experimental designs are. Independent groups, which is one of the ways we're going to look at, is where you basically recruit a participant and divide them into two separate groups. You literally split the groups in two. Each of those groups will sit one condition, and that's it. Right? Each of those groups will sit one condition. So this group on the left is going to listen to rock music whilst doing an object recognition task, whereas this group are going to listen to easy listening music such as Ludovico Einaudi. And then you're going to measure the DV for each group. Now, you need to know, firstly, that, but also the pros and cons of doing it this way. For example, this group is in every way potentially different to this group. Maybe this group are just, just you know, rockers, you know. So this whole rock music is not, they're going to really enjoy that, get into it. So you, you do need to know the, the issues to do with this. 
So independent group design uh, is where different participants are using each condition. Um, the advantages is um, it's quite, I guess it's quite easy. It's quite easy to do. It's, um, uh, it's shorter. It's shorter because you're not having to get everybody to do all conditions. You've got half the people doing one condition, half the people doing another condition. So an advantage, I guess you could write, is independent groups design is typically shorter than repeated measures. And this is a good thing because it takes less time and time is money. The good, the really good thing, though, is that there's no order effects. Now, you do need to know order effects, and I would like you to define order effects. Order effects are essentially effects seen um, when you do a second condition. So say I get you all to do the first condition, right? listen to rock music. Yeah, this is interesting, fine. And you have a five-minute break. If I get you to then do the second condition, you're going to experience order effects. You're going to be bored. You're going to be tired, for example. You're going to be a bit, you know, uninterested. And therefore, that's going to affect the validity of the study. So that is what order effects are, boredom and tiredness. If I say what are order effects, I'm hoping you say boredom and tiredness. Um, you also don't experience what are called practice effects. Practice effects are where you naturally get better in the second condition because you've you've done it already, right? So if we go back to this one just here, um, if I were to, this group only does one condition, so they're not going to get bored, they're not going to get tired, and they're not going to they're not going to experience practice effects because they only do one condition. If they were to do this condition and then that condition, by the time they do the second condition, they've probably gotten better at the at the task, in this case, visual object recognition. So I guess one thing to, to, to be aware of, um, order effects typically means performance goes down in the second uh, condition. Practice effects typically means it goes up, but either way, it's not valid. But either way, it's not valid. It may take you a couple of, if you don't understand the concept of validity yet, um, it may take you a couple of uh, times to actually wrap your head around that. But the good thing about independent groups is that it doesn't have any order effects because you you aren't tired or bored because you don't do a second condition. You don't Your performance isn't getting better because you're not doing a second condition. You literally only do one condition. Um, obviously, the, the issues with this, though, is that the people in the people in both halves are different people. So you're going to experience individual differences. Individual differences are is basically the concept whereby, I'm gonna to try to find this, individual differences is basically the concept whereby one group of people is significantly different from the other and thus shouldn't be compared because they have different abilities, penchants, ta talents, you know, so on and so forth, skills. So that is basically independent uh, groups, right? I'm not going to go through random allocation, though you do actually need to know it. Um, I'm going to go through repeated measures. Now, a, a good way to define repeated measures in one sentence, all participants do all conditions. All participants do all conditions. So you recruit a group of people, and they do both conditions. They do both conditions, right? They do condition one, then they have a break, then they do condition two. Now, the good thing about this is that this group of people is exactly the same as this group of people. So you have no individual differences. There are big issues with this one, though. There are big issues with this one. Obviously, an advantage is that it does require fewer participants because you know, the same people in condition A are doing it in condition B. So you don't need to double the recruitment of participants. Uh, does take longer? Yeah, it could be argued to take longer, I should say. But the main thing here is there is no risk of individual differences confounding the results of the study because you are literally comparing that person to that exact same person and you would compare the scores.
The issues, though, is that you're going to experience demand characteristics. I'm going to go that there, there, there is a few of these, to be honest with you. But demand characteristics are basically demand characteristics are basically whereby um, they are the cues or the clues that give away what a study is about. Why does this happen? If you do the first condition, which is rock music, right? Uh, you're going to think, oh, okay, rock music, visual, oh, oh, for, 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 for. and then you do the second condition, which is easy listening music, you're going to think, oh, I know what they're doing here. I know what they're doing. Whereas if you just did rock music, you don't know what the other condition is. You're not told what the other condition is till after the study. So the fact that you do one uh, condition and then you do the other that allows you to be able to see what they are clearly studying now if you if you know what the cues or the clues of the study are if you if you fit if you experience demand characteristics basically that's going to lead to social desirability bias whereby you think oh i know what you're after here i'm going to try to do better in this condition so you get the results that you want and therefore, it's going to lower the validity because you're not accurately measuring. The participant is trying to please you. Is tr The participant is trying to get you the result that you need. That's not accurate. That's not saying that would naturally happen in real life. So demand characteristics are a big issue here because the, the participant figures out, ah, okay, I, know what's, I know what's going on here. I know what's going on. You also do experience uh, order effects because by the second condition, right, they've done the first condition, right, brilliant, uh, rock music, ACDC, brilliant, that was fantastic. And then they go off and listen to I and Audi and they're like, oh, do I have to do this again? Right, I'm, I'm bored, I'm tired, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to quickly do this. And again, therefore, I'm, I'm just going to quickly do this. You're not accurately measuring what it is you need to measure. Counterbalancing does actually get around this issue, though. Um, and I think I do go into counterbalancing here, yeah. Counterbalancing is basically, I'd like you to write this down. Counterbalancing is basically an advanced form of repeated measures. It's an advanced form of repeated measures. What it basically is, is you, you take the whole sample and you split it in half. And the first half does condition A and then B, and the second half does condition B and then A. Right, and it's called ABBA, A, B, B, A, right, when you ABBA them. Some students then say, well, hold on a second, this is independent groups because you're splitting them into two groups. Not quite, because at the end of the day, all conditions, so all participants are doing all conditions, and that makes it repeated measures. This group is doing A then B, this group is doing B then A. What that does, what that does is, <clears throat> I'm gonna say this because it's not actually typed down. Doing condition A and then B and then B and then A, it doesn't reduce the amount of order effects. It doesn't reduce the amount of order effects. What it does is it spreads the order effects equally among condition A and condition B. Remember, order effects always happen in the second condition. You're bored in the second condition. You're tired in the second condition. So if this group is doing B, A, then B, order effects hit B. If this condition, if this part, if these participants do B, then A, order effects hit A. So please do not make the mistake of saying that counterbalancing reduces or eliminates order effects. It literally does not reduce one single order effect. What it does is it spreads it equally between conditions A and conditions B. Therefore, it's not as much of an effect. The last one is matched pairs. Matched pairs, I suppose you could argue, is an advanced form of independent groups. I suppose you could argue that. Um, you recruit a you group of participants, as you always do, through sampling methods, opportunity, volunteer, random, systematic, stratified. You, you recruit them however, way, however which way you want. And then you find out what sort of group of people you have in your, your group. And then you match them by recruiting another group that matches them for, and this is really important, one key characteristic. Sometimes students say something stupid like, I'm going to match my personality. You're going to match them. 
on the exact same personality. Now, if you said personality type, you know, there are 16 personality types. If you were to say 60, well, I'd match them on one of the 16 personality types. So I, I'm an ESTJ, for example. I'm an ESTJ. That would make sense. But if you're going to say you're going to match them on personality, that would be ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> so you are matching them on one key characteristic. Uh, and then you treat them basically as independent measures. Right? This group is going to sit condition one. This group is going to do condition two. But what you've done is because, because one of the issues of independent measures is that of individual differences, you know, this group is very different to that group. What you are doing is you're reducing that problem by matching them very, very slightly um, and kind of treating them quite similarly. Um, so match pairs, the key thing you have to know about match pairs is you have to have a pretest of some kind, something to match them on. So for example, the example I give here, if you're pairing IQ, you actually have to state in your exam question, which you would have, you probably are going to get at some point about match pairs, you would have to state, oh, I would do a pretest. In this case, I'd do an IQ test. I'd get them all the IQ scores. And then I would slowly begin matching them and putting them in separate conditions. Put them in separate conditions, match them. Right, uh, those two have got right, look, those two have got an IQ of 107. Right, that one goes condition A, that one goes condition B, and they're paired. And that, so you you have to explain the process. And that process, by the way, has to be both practical and replicable. It has to be sensible, and it has to be a, like I literally have it has to have enough detail that I can go out and copy what exact thing you've done. Um. And those are the strengths and the weaknesses. Uh, the good, the good, oh, hold on one second. Yep. Sorry about that. I thought I hit, I thought I hit myself away, but clearly not well enough. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so the, the good thing about mash pairs is that there are no order effects and it's reduced risk of individual differences. But the big thing is that it takes ages. It takes ages. You have to do a pre-test. You don't have to do that in the other ones. You have to match them. Don't have to do that in the other ones. So it can take quite a long time. The other thing I'm going to say, which is quite a fancy point, if I do say so myself, is um, a disadvantage is it doubles the attrition rate. The attrition rate is basically the dropout rate. So because you've matched them, because you've matched them, if one person drops out the study, this person has no one to be matched to. So generally speaking, they have to drop out the study as well. So if it doubles the attrition rate, also known as the dropout rate for the layman. Um, and that, to be honest, is it. That is it. That's it for um, uh, experimental designs. Um, strengths and weaknesses you do need to know. You're not going to get like 16 markers on it, but you do need to know all those strengths and the weaknesses. The good thing about matched pairs, and in, sorry, the good thing about independent groups and repeated measures, the strengths and weaknesses are basically antagonistic. Right. The strength of one is the weakness of the other and vice versa. Right. So that's 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 one way to be able to dig yourself out of a hole. As always, hope it was useful.